Good morning. So glad that we could be together. I uh, didn't post a video last week or a sermon last week. It was our homecoming uh, at church, and uh, we were fortunate enough to have Ken Vaughn share with us and that. Uh, so I'm going to pick back up this week with this sermon, and it's going to be uh, the parable of the weeds out of Matthew 13. And as we begin there, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we could study your word just now. I pray that you bless the hearers that are listening to this message. May you take care of them. May you bless their lives. Father, may we honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I'm so glad. And we're continuing in our uh, series through the parables of Jesus. Really enjoyed this series. Um, But if you look over in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter uh, 13, we're going to start at verse 24. Now, what's interesting about this, this parable particularly is Jesus tells the parable, and then he gives a very detailed explanation of it. I think it starts about verse 43, or excuse me, verse 36, about the parable. There's a break in between there. But again, a fascinating parable, um, and then the explanation follows. So let's read it. Matthew 13, 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who uh, sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up, the weeds? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up some of the wheat with them. Let both grow together until it's the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned and then gather the wheat and bring them into the barn. Now, that is the parable. Now, Jesus later explained what the parable was talking about, verse 36, and that will give the setting of the story. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples said to him, explain the parable of the weeds in the field. He said, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvest the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be for the, at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom and everything that causes sin and, who, uh, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. One of the things that I love to do, and I may have said it before, is I love to garden. It's one of my hobbies. I love it when springtime rolls around, particularly about mid-May for our area. And I generally, uh, uh, even two to four weeks ahead of time, will turn my soil over, prepare it, uh, bring in maybe some topsoil, put in some fertilizer, get everything ready for the planting season. Now, I don't have a very big garden, but I love to be able to turn the soil over and put some plants in the ground. I generally put out uh, quite a few tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers, squash, zucchini. Love all those things and, and peppers. And as I grow those things, um, I enjoy watching them grow more than about anything else. I'll go out almost on a daily basis just to see how much they have grown or sprouted up or, or, or see when uh, it starts to flower and then later the bud and then the plant itself or the, the fruit or the vegetable. I love to watch all that take place. Well, one of the things that I do on a regular basis is I go through and weed my garden. Now, some people take plastic and put it on top of their garden to keep the moisture in or, or straw or whatever it might be, but I generally don't. I just generally uh, leave it just the topsoil and put the plants in and, and make enough room to be able to walk through the plants. But I'll take a hoe in hand or maybe my tiller and run through there just to turn the soil over to keep it freshened up and keep air circulating through there. And in addition to that, I also will weed it. it makes sense. I don't let a weed grow up in there at all, and I keep the edges trimmed real nicely. Well, one of the things that I know about uh, gardening, even though it's quite limited, is I know you don't want weeds in your garden because what happens is they'll soon choke out the plant if you allow it to, whatever it might be, especially when the plants are incredibly tender and young. 
But interesting enough, in this particular parable, Jesus says, don't pull up the weeds. Now, as I said, I'm limited in my gardening knowledge, but I know that weeds aren't a good thing, and and I won't let them grow up as the gardener. But Jesus says there, don't pull the weeds. Don't don't weed the garden. Don't weed the, the wheat as it's growing up. And so I'm trying to understand that, and it doesn't really make sense, at least to me personally. And why would someone not pull the weeds? Why would God not pull weeds? It doesn't really make sense. Now, in this particular parable, it starts actually in Matthew, the very beginning chapter, Matthew 13, verses 1 through 23, is the parable of the sower. The idea that's presented there, it seems, is that you are be uh, persistent or persevere. Uh, and that's what it's talking about, the, the different kinds of seed that kind of grow up. And that's the idea. And the idea that you get from both of these is that the church is in the world. And that's the idea that you get from it. And that's both pictures in, in both different stories. Then you move on to chapter 13, verse 24, the parable of the uh, weeds. And as you look there, it talks about good seed and bad seed. And and the enemy had maliciously come in and sowed uh, bad seed among the good seed. And it was broadcasted or shared out. Then it grew up. And before we get started, let's review what Jesus was telling us about this parable. What's the breakdown? The farmer is the son of man. We understand that. The good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. He explains that. The enemy is Satan. He says so. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the harvest is at the end of the age, the judgment day. And I'm not going to uh, talk so much about judgment today, but particularly how that parable impacts us directly, not at the end of the age, but right now, today, living in the church and going about our business. Now, as we understand that, let's uh, set the story and try to understand the time frame of that particular time. There's something that Jesus' audience probably would have understood more so than us in our time. At the time when uh, you talk about wheat in Jesus' day, uh, most theologians, most uh, uh, most uh, commentaries that I have read said, in all likelihood, the weed that they're talking about is called a bearded darnel. You can look that up for yourself, bearded darnel. And as you look at it, it actually has the name of called false wheat because it looks so much like wheat that it looks uh, almost like a twin of it. And so that could be the plant that they're talking about because it's hard to tell the difference until it's harvest time. And one of the things, one of the dangers of the bearded darnel is that it also, if you harvest it and mix it in and feed it to your family, it's a poison. It it can cause death and and cause uh, drowsiness. Uh, It's a poison. So you have to be really, really careful. So in this parable, Jesus is telling that Satan's goal is to actively undermine the gospel. That's his, his goal. He wants to do everything he can to hurt God and hurt God's people. And so he wants to present a substitute to those around him. And to the untrained eye that's false wheat, that's false teachers, this false teaching, will look just like the real thing. And you have to pay attention. And sometimes they will have half-truths or partial truths in their teaching, but as you listen to the complete message they have to share, something goes off in your head or something in Scripture you will read, and you'll say, wait a minute, that's not what the Scriptures teach, and we run into that. But once that full body of knowledge of the false teachers is shared, there should be something to clue us in that there's a problem. And so that's the case. There's a preacher that is incredibly popular that is regularly on television at this time. He's been very, very successful, produced many books, and has done very, very well. And if you watch him, he oozes self-confidence. Positivity would be a good description. He's handsome. He has a, a suit, has a smile on his face that just goes on. It's so sticky sweet that people just seem to throng to that kind of message. But if you sit down and listen to his message completely, you will never hear sin. You'll never hear about Christ's sacrifice. You will never hear about the things that are going on that you need to repent of. Matter of fact, you can live your best life now almost as if you really don't need Christ. And see, that's false teaching, and we should see it as nothing less than that. 
So we have to be really careful and listen to the message that's presented. You see, the gospel he presents is a health and wealth gospel. Well, you're God's child. God wants nothing but good for you. Well, we don't hear the testing of our faith. We don't hear about repentance. We don't hear a heart of contrition or a contrite heart that comes before God and seeks forgiveness. We don't hear about sin. And all those things are a part of the gospel message. You see, if Christ came into the world, he came to save us from our sins to grant us heaven. And that's a part of the gospel message. And so many don't, people don't want to preach that or teach that, but that's about who you are. That's about who we are. Paul said in 2 Timothy, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Well, where does this false teaching come from? I mean, do they wake up one day and go, well, I'm going to teach something false. I'm going to teach something different than the gospel. No, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that many of the people that are false teachers are sincere in what they're teaching. Uh, they believe it wholeheartedly. I, I, I think they've sacrificed even for it, some of them. But how do they get to that point? Well, I think one thing is that they do is they fall in for Satan's deceptions. And Satan's good at it, just, just like he was in this particular story. The seed that was sown, the farmer didn't even know anything about it or wasn't aware of it in that particular story. Matthew chapter 4 explains the temptations of Jesus. And in it, I think it gives how Satan works on us and against us, and has since the beginning of time. He uses the same tricks because they work. One of the first things that Satan uses is pride, our own pride, not his, but our own pride. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, and Jesus has presented these temptations. It said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to turn to bread. There's a temptation, pride. Well, prove it, Jesus, if you're as great as you say you are. And most of us, uh, somebody dares us, oh, we want to prove we're right. Well, I, I can slam dunk a basketball, or I can do this, or I can do that. Well, prove it. Okay, watch. See, pride can be a part of that. Come and prove who you are. And, and it may be that some of these religious leaders that are out in the world that are false teachers want to pride themselves on who they are and what they've done and not what the scriptures teach or what God's done. A second temptation for people, oh, power. Power is such a, such a great, great temptation. And as we see that, he says, uh, Satan said to Jesus, I will give you all this. He showed him all the kings of the world. I'll give you all this if you simply bow a knee to me. If you bow a knee to me, you'll have all the power you want. You won't have to go through the crucifixion. You won't have to go through that pain of, of taking everyone's sin upon yourself power. It's an incredibly intoxicating thing. And if we're not careful, that, that can be a, a case for us. Many of us can't handle the accolades of others. And there's a reason God keeps us humble. It's because our pride will get in the way, our seeking of power. One other temptation is conjecture. Well, what if? What if this happened? Or, or what if this doctrine were true that we find in Scripture? What would that mean? You see, you have that here. Satan said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, again, there's pride. He said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you that, he, that, that they will lift you up in their hands so that they will not strike your foot against a stone. There's the what if. Well, if you're really the son of God, it says that, you know, in Psalms that he will not allow your foot to strike a stone. What if? Conjecture. And a lot of people fall in for that, especially in the false teaching world. Well, what if this doctrine were true? Or, or, or let's read this one verse and take it out of the context of its setting. Satan used scripture oftentimes to turn it against the very people that should be honoring God. It's not uncommon. Half-truths are so very, very powerful, but they're still a lie. You see, we can be so easily misled because, as I said, something can look good and sound good, but oftentimes it's too good to be true. But we can't let ourselves to be fall into that temptation. Pride, we need to keep ourselves humble. But one of the things we need to do is study the Bible. Here's what I found for me personally, that as I studied the, complete, the completeness, the entirety of the Scriptures, and read it on a regular basis, 
I will hear some teaching and I'll think, well, that doesn't sound right. I don't know why. I can't put my finger on it. But it's because as you study the entirety of the Word of God, oftentimes it reveals itself a little bit more completely that we might understand a little bit better about those kind of things. So now back to the question. Why doesn't God pull the weeds out? That's intriguing to me. It makes me stop and think. Why doesn't God pull the weeds out? Well, first of all, notice the weeds are in the world. They're not in the church. You see, in the church, we're challenged to to, uh, stand up against false teaching. We're commanded to weed out the false teaching and those that might be uh, leaders of that. Romans 16, 17, he says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way, that they are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. So we're told to guard against them. The church is commanded to pull pull weeds. That's part of the elders, the preachers, the leaders' responsibility to guard against false teaching within the confines of the church. That's what they've been called to do, to shepherd the flock and guard against something that would be harmful to them. Second John verses 10 and 11 says, If anyone comes to you and does not bring the teaching about Jesus, do not take him into your home or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares the wicked. We're to guard against false teaching in our home and the church. Now, the weeds that we're talking about, the false teaching that we're talking about out of this parable is in the world. So there's a difference. And we need to recognize that. But out in the world, God doesn't yank up cultic individuals or false teachers like that. One of the greatest false teachings in our our world today is the Islamic faith, the Muslim faith. It goes contrary to everything Christianity stands for. It stands against Christ. It stands against his kingdom. It stands against God. But notice... God is allowing it to flourish on this world. As a matter of fact, the Muslim or the Islamic faith is outpacing Christianity by great odds or or great numbers. Their sheer number of of propagation of having children far outweighs those that call themselves Christians. So they're outpacing us quite easily. Why? God gives people a choice. If they want to follow him, they can. Or if they want to follow some false teaching, they can. And that's important to understand because, you see, God hasn't pulled those weeds up, those false teachers and the people that are in false religions, because they're not the enemy. Now, oftentimes we think of them as the enemy, but they're not. Jesus said the enemy who sows them is the devil. There's the enemy. Now, he's already been uh, judged, and there's no way that he's going to escape his judgment. But the people still have a choice. It says, while they were still pulling out the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. So there's a, there's a carefulness that God wants us to understand. Real physical weeds never change. I have uh, crabgrass growing up in my yard or whatever uh, plant wants to grow up in there is a weed. It's going to be a weed. It's not going to change. But people are different. Sons of the evil one can become followers of Jesus Christ. And you see, we need to understand that. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't pull the weeds up because, you see, he wants a chance for them to repent. He waits until that judgment day. He wants them to come to him. Matter of fact, 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 23 through 26 says this, Flee the evil desires of you to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolishness or stupid arguments because they, you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. See, God wants even those that are following false teaching to repent and come to him because, you see, that's so very important to him. The weeds 
aren't the enemy. The weeds have been taken captive by Satan's lies. And we are to be kind to them and patient. God wants them to turn to repentance. But how are they going to know the truth unless we are kind to them? By us knowing our Bible and being aware of the teachings that are found there. We're called upon to study the Word of God. That's important. False teaching, when uh, taken to the extremes, can be just devastating and so very, very sad. Not uncommon in Appalachian culture is snake handling. Some of y'all probably heard it before. I've never experienced or been in a church that does it. I've seen it uh, on videos and television and things like that, but it's really kind of a sad thing. Some will read Mark 16. If you go back and read the end of that chapter, it said some will handle snakes, and, or not really handle snakes, but be bitten and not uh, die because of the poison or whatever it might be. And I think that's really a direct reference to Acts, where Paul's bit, or bitten by a viper and he lives. But some take that as a promise to us, and I don't think that's the case at all. I think it was a promise to the apostles, not to us and the early church. But there was a man several years ago named Punkin Brown, Punkin Brown was a prolific preacher, well known for snake handling, and he uh, was very well known. And he believed that snake handling, he, if he were bitten, he wouldn't die, but that wasn't the case. He was preaching at a church at the age of 34 years old. He was bitten by a three foot timber rattler snake. He died within 10 minutes. Heartbreakingly sad. He left behind five children. And a sadder part of that is his wife believed those same things. Her name was Melinda. Three years before Punkin Brown was bitten, she was bitten and died as well. This couple, believing a false doctrine, left behind five children to be raised by somebody else. You see, when false teaching is taken to the extreme, it can be so very dangerous. Let me encourage you, study the Word of God. Read it on a regular basis. That's the only way that you're going to know what God teaches. Don't count on me or don't count on another preacher to tell you what the Word of God says. You be familiar with the Word of God. Study, mine it out on your own, dig it out. That's how important that is. I thank you for paying attention today and sharing with me. I pray the Lord will bless you and take care of you. Let's pray as we finish. God, thank you for today. Help us to be aware of your Word and understand it thoroughly. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.